Greetings, church. I'm glad that you've chosen to join us again as we worship Jesus together. Uh, I am actually going to be on vacation this weekend, and so it's exciting to be sharing the stage or bookcase with Chris Goff, and he's going to introduce us to part one of his sermon on the senses and how the gifts of leadership that come to the church uh, map over those in some interesting ways. It's an insight he's developed over uh, the last couple years, and he's going to share that with us today. It's coming right out of Ephesians chapter 4, so it's in our series, and, and it's a good chance for us to connect the dots in some ways. So I'm uh, looking forward to that. Uh, we're going to worship together first, and then he's going to come up. So uh, put your voices together, sing out, uh, he, Jesus, is worthy of your praise and your attention today. For 
the sins of the world His blood breaks the chains And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb Oh, every knee will bow before Him Who can stop the Lord stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Stop the Lord. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb. Slain for the sins of the world, his blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before him. Isaguah Christian Church, it's great to be with you. Uh, just such a gift to be with the body of Christ, even, even through this digital mode. Um, just knowing so many of your faces and so many of your families and uh, getting texts and just communicating with you guys and chatting during a Sunday service. It's, it's so fun to um, be a part of this greater body. Uh, but it's not just fun, it's actually pretty critical. Um, for us to fulfill and be a part of God's mission in this world. Uh, community isn't just good for community's sake. Community is good because history is directional and God is actually moving things toward his purposes. And he's actually intended for us to be together in that work. Uh, let's take a look at, we're going to be looking at Ephesians 4 this week. I know we're going back a little bit, but um, uh, I don't know, a month and a half ago or something, uh, I said, Aaron, when you get to Ephesians 4, I'd love to share because I've been talking about these uh, gifts and doing some research on this, and it'd be fun to share that. But it just works out that this was the weekend I could share on this. So we'll do, we're kind of stepping back a little bit, but I think you'll find it, it's right in line with all the things that um, uh, we're studying in the book of Ephesians. And, you know, I, I would just say, before we get to Ephesians 4, if you could turn to Acts 9... Uh, sorry, Acts 6, we're going to start with a story there. But I would just say, you know, really the purpose of sharing out of Ephesians 4 today is that you are critical in the proper functioning of the body of Christ. Um, you may not feel that way. <laughs> I think right now with the craziness going on in the world, with quarantine happening and we're back, actually we're going back again, actually we're changing the rules again, um, with the confusion and people trying to do their best, but, but just hard to keep up with it. It's kind of, we kind of just don't know what to do half of the time. Um, a neighbor of mine helped me out a couple of weeks ago and I thanked them kind of profusely for giving, you know, for giving us a, a helping hand. And they said, no, you don't realize how helpful this was for me to actually do something positive and helpful in a time that just feels so chaotic and up in the air. And so, um, as we look at this passage today, as we talk through this idea of gifting, uh, my hope is that you would have a sense of God doesn't give you a gift for no reason. <laughs> God gives you a gift so that you could use your gift. Um, my wife was uh, reading some author, I wish I could quote them properly, but, but uh, this author, she said, God doesn't give people gifts, God gives the world gifts through people. And so, gift isn't 
you know, a gift isn't a gift until it's given. And um, that's, part of, that's part of the challenge for us from Ephesians 4. But first we're going to look at Acts 6. This is just a little narrative story, one of my favorite stories. I use it a ton in my work at Seattle's Union Gospel Mission uh, when I'm talking to pastors, especially new pastors that I'm building bridges with, um, as that's my job for, for Union Gospel Mission is to network and, and work with pastors. Uh, and I use this story a lot. So let's jump into this. It's a great little narrative. Uh, the Choosing of the Seven. So Acts 6, 1 through 7 is what we're going to read. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, and let me time out for just a second. Keep in mind with this story, um, we're just a couple chapters from the Holy Spirit descending on the, the early church. Remember G Acts 1, Jesus is, uh, resurrects, uh, or sorry, ascends into heaven and says, Go be my witnesses in Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. And he also says, don't leave Jerusalem, though, until you have the Holy Spirit. Um, and, and so they wait. And the next chapter, chapter 2, we, we have Peter's great sermon explaining what just happened with the tongues of fire coming down. If you have not read the book of Acts, it's totally nuts. It's totally awesome. You should read it. It's, it's what comes next after the Gospels, right? Like, Jesus left, so the story is over, right? No, the story goes crazy. And um, so just a couple chapters in here, we have people being healed because Peter walks by them and his shadow falls on them. I mean, just crazy stuff. But then we get to Acts 6 and we see, even with the Holy Spirit, just a couple chapters in, we see a, a precursor of the problem that Paul addresses in Ephesians happening in the early church. Let's read. In those days when the number of disciples is increasing, the Grecian Jews among them were complaining against the Hebraic Jews because their widows, the Greek widows, were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So, <laughs> Ephesians is this coming together, right? It's this uh, Jew and Gentile, hey, we need to come together. We're one in Christ. We're, we're living stones in this one temple. We are, you know, male and female, husband and wife, all these different things, parent and child. God is saying we're bringing these things together for the purposes of unity and for the purposes of, of God's body to be functioning rightly and properly. And so here we already have in, in, in chapter 6, the, the Hebrew widows are being treated well, but the Greek widows are not. So that's our problem here. So, verse 2, the 12 disciples, uh, the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God. In other words, it's our job to teach the Bible. It's our job to equip and train you. So it's not right for us to neglect this to go in order to wait on tables. In other words, to help feed uh, the, the, the widows. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. So in other words, the church leaders are saying, hey, we, we don't have time to do this ministry. We're trying to equip you. We're trying to um, uh, bring you the right teaching. We're, we're, praying, we're trying to be leading through prayer and listening and hearing from God. Um, we, we need to see where God is headed and we need to confer with, with one another as the 12, right? The, the apostles are saying, we, we got to kind of discern God's direction so that we know how to lead you guys. But we can't be out waiting on tables, in other words, feeding widows, when we're actually called to do something else. Uh, verse 5, the, this proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, uh, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles, who prayed and laid their hands on them. Uh, so, so everyone's like, yeah, the apostles, you should keep teaching, uh, but let's appoint these, these seven men full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom to, um, to feed and help care for and distribute food to widows. Uh, fascinating that food distribution requires the Holy Spirit and tons of wisdom. Um, and I don't mean that as a joke. I'm saying that because the lack of wisdom caused this problem, right? People were just serving their Jewish friends, not the Greek friends. What's fascinating about the seven they chose, if you get deep into it, 
each of those names actually has different ethnic origins. So it's interesting that they chose these different leaders uh, who are representing essentially different categories beyond maybe just Greek and, and uh, Hebrew. Um, so what happens? They pray for, they lay their hands um, on these uh, men and they prayed for them. And what's the result? Here's verse seven. Because of this work to the widows, the word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests, religious leaders, became obedient to the faith. Wow. I mean, this is a food ministry, right? This is, this is people helping distribute food to widows who are in need. And what's happening? People are coming to faith, and even religious leaders are starting to go, oh yeah, that's what this is all about. They're becoming obedient to the faith. Uh, an amazing, amazing story. One of my favorite stories in scripture uh, because of Ephesians 4. In Ephesians 4, if you want to turn there now, what we see is this idea that there's this unity in the body of Christ, but it gives some real specific direction to how the body needs to function and to how the body works. Um, so let's, let's look at this together. Ephesians 4, we're going to read um, uh, verse, verse 11 through 13. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith, and in knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Whoa. So essentially what he's saying is, we're giving some gifts. He mentions five gifts. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. He's saying, I'm giving you these gifts. Why? These are leadership gifts. Why? To equip you, to equip the body of Christ into works of ministry, so that they, so that they will be built up, so that they'll reach maturity, so that they'll have the full knowledge of the Son of God. And, um, and, and then this, I mean, it's kind of a catch-all, right? So that they will attain the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. The whole measure of the fullness of what Christ intended through these five leadership gifts. And um, I mean, I, I started studying this passage and particularly these five gifts because of a statement made... Um, by a guy named Bob Roberts. He's a pastor in Texas and um, successful church. He, he, he had a church plan. It grew to about a thousand people. And one day he kind of woke up with this Holy Spirit conviction and kind of a, you know, wake up in the middle of the night sweating kind of a deal. And he was like, I'm not making disciples. I'm not sure anyone's growing in maturity. <laughs> I'm not sure anyone's being sent. We're just, we're just kind of putting on a good show on Sunday. And he started to really panic about this. And, and he started saying, oh my gosh, what are we supposed to do? And he started digging into all these things. And he started making all these changes at his church. And people started leaving the church. And um, his conviction was, we have to send everybody. That was his conviction. Everybody has to go. When Jesus says in Acts 1, uh, go and be my you know, be my witnesses. He was saying that to everybody. And so he's like, we're not sending anyone. In fact, our staff are called ministers, meaning they do ministry. But here we have in Acts 4, it's saying, no, you're supposed to equip, the staff are supposed to equip the church to do ministry. And it's this kind of upside down cultural Christianity we've inherited from somewhere down the line where ministry is done by the paid staff and the rest of us kind of bathe in their awesomeness, right? Uh, and, and, uh, and enjoy the community and those sorts of things. I think, I think Paul's challenge to the church in Ephesians here in chapter 4 is, is a significant challenge. Um, so let's look at this, and I want to unpack this a little bit. Um, it says he gave some to be apostles. He's talking about the body of Christ. Gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors, and some to be teachers. Bob, they call him Crazy Bob, by the way. Uh, he's an awesome guy. There's tons of stories there. Um, but Crazy Bob, the pastor, um, 
he thought, you know, our church is being led by pastors. Um, and what about these other four gifts? You know, a pastor cares for the flock, protects the flock. His focus is entirely on the flock and caring and gathering them. You know, that, that passage where Jerus Jesus says, Jerusalem, I'd love to gather you under my wings. Um, that's the role of a pastor, protective, uh, caring, this pastoral gift. And he said, actually, that's the way our church in America is being led. We're being led by the pastor. Well, a critical gift, it's in the list. But he's like, well, what about these other gifts? So I want to unpack those a little bit uh, for us this weekend, because um, in looking in the other gifts, we get a fuller picture of the body of Christ and how it is we're actually supposed to function if we want to grow up into the maturity and in the fullness of Christ that Paul is talking about. So let's look at this first one. It was he, Christ, who gave some to be apostles. Um, now, I'm going to use a metaphor as we talk through these five gifts. Uh, the body, they're saying the body of Christ is led by these five gifts. Well, our bodies, my physical body, your physical body, is led by five senses, right? So we have sight, we have, we have sound, we have smell, we have touch, uh, we have taste. And our body, without these senses, right, we get in trouble pretty fast. In other words, if we don't have sight, we have a word for that. That's called blindness, you know. And it, and it is uh, difficult, more difficult to function in the world with blindness. It's more difficult to function in the world if you're deaf, if you can't hear, and so on and so forth. Um, and so what I'd like to do is look at these, these five gifts and, and kind of um, build a bridge to the five senses of the body. The point of the body isn't the five senses, right? <laughs> the point of the body is to operate and function in the world, but it's the five senses that help to guide the body. So let's look at this first gift, the gift of apostleship. The apostle leads the church. They see the risen Christ, right? The, the original apostles were, they physically saw Jesus. They knew Jesus. They saw him die. They saw him resurrected. When uh, in, in Acts 2, when they choose a new disciple and they, they draw lots and it's Matthias, they're like, pick someone from among us who's seen the whole thing, right? Who's been a part of this whole story. And it was Matthias that eventually got uh, pulled. But the apostles sees Jesus and they lead the church. They saw Jesus and they, and they lead the church. This is somebody who's entrepreneurial in nature, right? The, the apostolic gift, they're going out, right? I mean, the apostles went out, right? James went this way. Peter, Peter stayed in, in Jerusalem. Paul goes all over the place. The apostles are entrepreneurial. They're going. They're starting. They're launching. They're leading the, the, the uh, congregation out of the building. Um, and I like to say in each sphere of, of the kingdom, business, they're leading people out into the business world. They're leading people out into education. They're leading people out into healthcare, into technology. They're leading people into government, leading people into how to, how to manage your family and run your family and raise your children in the knowledge and, and fullness of Christ. Uh, leading out into arts and media, leading out into agriculture and into the environment. They're able to lead in this way because they can see Christ's plan for maturity in this world. They can see uh, Jesus' goal to fill the entire earth with, with the fullness of Christ. They can see it. They see the vision. And so when you consider the sense of sight, your brain, 80% of your brain is dedicated to processing vision. That's pretty wild. 80% of what's going on is because of our vision. So the vision is the leading sense of the body, just as the apostolic gift is the leading gift of the body. Um, 1 Corinthians 9.1, uh, Paul says, you know, defending himself, Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Right? It's this idea that because we see, uh, we, we know how to lead. If you don't have vision, right? Think of, and I, and I don't mean the sense, I mean vision. If you don't have vision, you can't lead, right? Everybody follow me. Oh, where are we going? I'm not really sure. Well, that's somebody who doesn't have a vision. It's hard to follow that person for very long. The person who has clarity around vision, the person who understands what they see, the person who knows how to articulate what they see, 
that person has that apostolic visionary gift, that entrepreneurial gift of, I see something that no one else can see and we got to go after it, right? We need to engage um, our, our, uh, our local city council. Somebody, we need a presence. We need salt and light and yeast in the local city council. We need salt and light and yeast uh, over at the hospital. Unfortunately, we have several people here at the church who work there. Let's get them together. Let's pray for them. Let's commission them. Let's lay our hands on them. Just like these seven men who were sent out to work with the widows, this kind of visionary thinking is supposed to lead the church. What happens when the body doesn't have this gift functioning? It's, a, it's an interesting question. Let's look at the second gift. Um, some to be apostles, some to be prophets. Um, a prophet hears from God, right? Um, a prophet has this ability, right? Amos is out working in his farm. God gives him a word. He leaves the farm, goes to Jerusalem to confront the leadership, and then he goes back to his farm. I mean, who does that, right? Who wakes up and God says for me to go to Washington, D.C., uh, confront Democrats and Republicans over how they're handling some issue, and then come back to Seattle? Uh, that's somebody who heard from God. This is someone who listens and knows the voice of the Lord. They know that whisper. They know that uh, stirring of the Holy Spirit. Um, many people claim to speak for God. But the prophet is in unique that they're claiming they heard God, right? Uh, they, they hear God before they speak. The prophet works tightly with the apostle. Um, if you think of how your body functions again, if there was a loud crash, let's say while we're, while we're uh, doing church here together and one of the kids spills something, we'll hear it first. And then what do we do? We look, right? So our our hearing and our vision are so tight to one another that it's like, oh, you heard that from the Lord? Well, that helps me understand this vision. Let's move. Let's go. We got we to gotta clean up the milk <laughs> or we've, we've got to move into this new space of ministry. We need to, we need to commission some folks and get them, get them going. Uh, so this prophetic gift is so powerful. Isaiah 42, 18 through 20 talks about Israel being blind and deaf and therefore completely unable to, to follow God. Think about that. Blind and deaf to the point where they are actually incapable of following God. Um, there's a story um, <clears throat> in a book called A General Theory of Love where this prince um, wants to know what language God speaks. And this is back in the 1300s, I think. He was a, I, I don't know, I won't pin it on a country because I can't remember, but he, he wants to know what language God speaks. So he, um, he's got these, you know, a couple dozen babies brought to the, the palace. And he's like, no one say a word to these babies. We can feed them, clothe them, hold them, rock them, take care of their physical needs, do all these things. But no one talk because I want to figure out their natural language because that maybe would be the language of God. Are they speaking French? Are they speaking German? Are they speaking English? What, what language are they speaking? His experiment ended pretty badly because what happened ultimately, no voice heard from these babies, all of them died. Not being able to hear was a death sentence for these little kids. And so the language of God, of course, is love. <laughs> and love was not given to these children. And so hopefully he learned that lesson. But this gift of hearing is so important. Listen to Moses, uh, Exodus 3. Uh, three through four. So Moses thought, I will go over and see the strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses answered, here I am. Later, uh, a few chapters later, it says Moses listened. That was a primary function of Moses. Moses was a prophet. And one of his primary functions is he listened to God and he obeyed, Right. Uh, there's that great story in Numbers where Aaron <clears throat> um, and Miriam are arguing about Moses being married to a non-Hebrew woman, and God says to them, <laughs> why are you not afraid to speak against Moses? To other people, you know, I speak to them in dreams or visions or whatever. He's like, to Moses, I speak directly. My, he hears my actual voice. 
Why are you not afraid to speak against this person? This prophetic gift is massive. Can you imagine saying to the congregation, hey, Issaquah Christian Church, we don't really need to hear God. We can just kind of go about Christian-ish activity. Um, that's, that's a death sentence to the power of the Holy Spirit moving through the congregation and moving through the body. I love Samuel where he says, speak for your servant is listening. And, and of course, the Lord says to Samuel, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears it tingle. Um, uh, <clears throat> in the comments, hopefully we'll get it in there. In the comments, uh, I made a little playlist, which is kind of cool. If you're uh, wanting to jump on and look at some of these, maybe after the service, uh, not during, after the service, but a little YouTube playlist that shows some people uh, in each of these five senses. So for, for the site, <clears throat> there's uh, a Humboldt County Sheriff who's given some enchroma glasses. And what this does is it actually tricks the brain of people who are colorblind to be able to see color. So it's a cool thing. It's like, here's this person who didn't have this gift in a sense, although he could see he was just colorblind, but he puts on these glasses and all of a sudden he can see purple for the first time. He can see orange for the first time. Uh, at one point in the video, he says, I can't wait to look at the sunset with my wife. Can you imagine reclaiming a gift like sight to the body, reclaiming the sense of sight to a body, reclaiming a leadership gift in the church, this apostolic gift where we actually see and have a vision of where God wants us to go. Uh, in the hearing one, there's a, a video of um, someone getting uh, cochlear implants and someone who's completely deaf is now able to hear. There's a ton of videos actually on YouTube there. I mean, make sure you have a box of Kleenex when you watch these. But it's this idea of reclaiming these gifts. It's so powerful. So that was part one of his sermon. And next week we'll pick up part two. And you've got a little homework to do, don't you? Uh, check out the playlist. Um, that's going to be in the description here on YouTube. And you'll be able to um, watch some of those videos. Again, they're, they're very amazing. When, when a sense is recovered, it's transformative. And we hope that that's the parable for you too in your life as the church, as we think about what is God up to? What, what is his uh, work in the world right now? Well, it's through you and, and through me. And as together, as we pursue this, we're going to see God open up some really amazing uh, things. So before we sing another song, I just want to mention, um, make sure you go to our website to connect and to give. Um, you're going to find uh, resources there. You can sign up on our front page for the newsletter. Um, so stay, stay in tune there. Stay uh, connected with us. And uh, let's, let's worship him together. Um, I'll be back in a minute as, as I lead us in a time of communion. And um, let's just prepare our hearts.
In his sermon, part one, Chris mentioned uh, those men who were filled with the Spirit, who were assisting the widows and were caring for the poor and involved in that entire process. Uh, he, Stephen was one of those men who, who became uh, a target of persecution. In fact, he was killed. But he followed in the way of Jesus. Last week we looked at how Jesus on the cross said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Stephen was so full of the Spirit that in his sermon as, as he comes to a close and then as they actually stone him to death, he has very similar words. Um, in fact, Acts chapter 7, I commend to you, it's like, uh, it's like the Cliff's Notes version of the Old Testament. It's the story up till now. Acts chapter 7. Uh, you might enjoy that. But here we have, in the end of Acts chapter 7, when they heard this speech, and when he had put it on them for persecuting and killing Jesus, they were enraged, they ground their teeth at him, but he, full of the Holy Spirit, well, that's what we're supposed to be full of, right? Full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. This is, that's his place. Daniel chapter 7. That ties in really well with Acts chapter 7 here. He sees him standing at the right hand of God. But they crowd out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord, receive my spirit. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. The reason God can not hold our sins against us is because he himself gave up his life. And Stephen's prayer should be our prayer, of course, because we live in this household of forgiveness, all made possible by the death of Jesus, which breaks the bondage of sin. Sin has been condemned in the flesh of Jesus, and, and so he offers that to us today. And so we remember, we take the bread which is broken for us, it's his body, and we eat it in remembrance of him. And Jesus shed his blood. Um, the martyrs have shed their blood with forgiveness on their lips. And so as we drink to this covenant, we say to Jesus, <laughs> we receive you and we receive your way. Would you fill us with your spirit and help us be a gift to all those around? Right? This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you. Drink in remembrance of me. Well, my prayer is that you would be richly blessed until we meet again. Hopefully we'll see you on site uh, at our 10.30 a.m. service. Uh, we're not providing child care right now uh, or children's ministry uh, because of the, <laughs> the issues uh, surrounding keeping everybody safe. Um, but we hope that you can join us if you're able. And we hope to see you. I'm going to play for you uh, at the very end here. Uh, song. Chris Goff is actually in this with his wife Rebecca and, and son Zeb. Um, it's a blessing uh, from the Pacific Northwest churches. Uh, you've heard this song many times, and now this is a blessing over you um, here in the Pacific Northwest.
face toward you and give you peace. Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. Go before you and behind you and beside you. 